answers to other weekly meetup. Um, so I have a few topics that I wanted to go over uh, at this meeting, uh, specifically one that's somewhat controversial, uh, but it's you know not a final decision by any means because in the end the community will always be the one to uh, mix these kind of decisions. So it will uh, require a clean vote. So more or less what it boils down to is after doing some research um, we found that it's possible for or, or at least at this point in time it seems possible to us that uh, the blockchain EOS could be used as our base layer uh, for Novosphere and we wouldn't actually need to uh, build our own blockchain. Now this was actually a kind of surprising discovery because when we initially set out to do this project and I had done the research on the existing projects at the time, uh, the biggest smart contract platform at the time was Ethereum and there were a few other smart contract platforms like Lisk and then of course you have other platforms that do have some quote quote smart functionality like NXT and Waves but they don't have programmable functionality. So in the case of let's say Novosphere as it was currently planned, Novosphere as it's currently planned was to have smart functionality that's very specific to what our tasks are. So it would be implemented in a similar way to how NXT and Waves functions. So anyways, going back to my point about smart contracts. Um, so I had done extensive uh, an extensive look at uh, existing blockchains and none really satisfied the needs that we needed for uh, Novosphere to work. And so there were there are two major needs that we have. Um, so the first is the capacity in terms of on-chain transactions for a proper ecosystem. And the other major uh, thing that we need is how the actual economic model of Novosphere works. So with almost every blockchain, it works off of a fee model. So everyone should be fairly familiar with this. On Bitcoin, you send a transaction, you pay a fee. On Ethereum, you send a transaction, you pay a fee. On Ethereum, you call a smart contract function. For example, when you transfer an ERC20 token, you're actually calling a smart contract function transfer, uh, and you pay a fee. So the fee is always paid by the user. So even in a system, for example, we see memo.cash recently built on Bitcoin Cash. Um, very cool uh, in terms of what it does. But the problem is you pay a fee. And even if Bitcoin Cash could redesign itself to look like Twitter, feel like Twitter, nobody would use a Twitter where you pay every time you do an action because nobody likes to lose money. It feels bad. Uh, not only that, but the value of money is very different to people. So $1 to a US citizen is very different to $1 to someone, say in India, or uh, anywhere in the second world, or in the third world for that matter. So because of this, even though, let's say, Bitcoin Cash might flaunt fees of a fraction of a cent, we don't know if it'll stay that way, and this poses a problem. That's why the blockchain, or that blockchain model, is not really uh, very good in terms of the economic model to build these kind of platforms. So let's let's tackle a few things as to um, what the pros and cons of what building on EOS is. And I, I you know, forward disclaimer, I'm sort of skipping over uh, giving a you know intro to EOS. I, I, I figure that most of you guys have at least heard of it. Uh, if, assuming you stay up to date with, you know, a lot of the big blockchain projects that are going on in the space. So, so I think one of the first things to talk about is what changes in terms of the uh, economic model of Novosphere. And Unicron, feel free to, uh, you know, step in in case uh, you think I miss anything or if uh, I misspeak about something. So, in terms of the economic model of Novosphere, um, I don't really think too much actually changes if we were to build it as an EOS uh, application. And so what I mean by that is, um, instead of block producers, so it, let's break down the hierarchy of like what, what actually happens in the Novosphere ecosystem. Um, 
So one of the one of the first things that we need to look at is the the block producers and the block producers uh, being voted in and being rewarded. So in this case, if we were to build as DAP on EOS, there are no block producers. However, we can substitute this role in terms of the board members or the the block producers, the delegates, whatever you want to call them. Um, we can say that this role is now uh, to run public gateways. So this actually is. Uh, you know, it's not a pro or a con, right? Because we get a different aspect out of it. So in the old system, we couldn't incentivize people to run a public gateway just because, let's say, you were a block producer, unless we introduced an extra inflation mechanism. But let's say you were a block producer, um, this doesn't necessarily imply that you are running a public gateway. And likewise, you might be a really good block producer in terms of having a beefy uh, hardware setup, but not want to run a public gateway. So in this system in the DAP, we actually incentivize a few people to run public gateways that any user can use. So the first thing that you might think of is why would we want more than one public gateway? Um, so for example, Steemit, to my knowledge, functions off of just one public gateway, and this works fine for the most, for the most part. Um, so, or, or other alternative, uh, like links other than just steamit.com, maybe Unicron would know this one, but, um, so in terms of public gateways, it, it, there's two advantages I can think of that we get out of this, which is, um, we get more resistance in terms of, let's say, someone trying to knock down a public gateway via an attack, let's say a DDoS or whatever, uh, they have to take down more public gateways, so that's more expended resources from an attacker. But I think the more interesting aspect that this introduces when, you, when we have more people running public gateways is we end up having Novosphere nodes running in multiple legal jurisdictions. So. What I mean by that is obviously each person who runs a public gateway should be doing it in a way that's compliant with whatever the legal standards are where they live. But we do know that the legal standards uh, from different countries uh, vary greatly. Uh, for example, how copyright laws are handled, let's say, in certain countries like the US uh, versus, let's say, how they're handled in China. So I, I think having public gateways uh, spread out could actually be really good for the project for those, those two reasons. So uh, another point to really tackle is, I guess this more so relates to the FUD relating around EOS. So a lot of people will say, well, I guess maybe it's not just EOS, it's uh, DPoS in general, delegated proof of stake, which is there's a lot of people, especially from the Ethereum crowd who uh, may or may not feel threatened by EOS, who will say, um, you know, it's it's centralized. And um, I don't agree with that, and I don't think Unicron agrees with that either, um, especially when you look at how the delegate system works in comparison to how mining pools work and how much uh, of Ethereum's mining pools are just actually concentrated into two pools. I, I think that makes up actually the bulk of Ethereum's mining power. And with Bitcoin, it's maybe like, what, eight or ten pools? So it's really not that different. Um, so arguably, uh, DPoS chains are more uh, decentralized, but let, let, let's let's say for sake of example that it is uh, centralized, uh, just let's do an exercise. Um, so the thing is, is that even if it was uh, centralized, the first thing to note is uh, as a DAP, we do not have um, liability over what is in the DAP, first of all. So let's say the blockchain was centralized uh, and they started centering transactions relating to our DAP, our DAP being Novosphere. Um, this is a really good way to shoot yourself in the foot in terms of your blockchain projects, right? Can you imagine like the headlines, EOS is censoring transactions? And you know, this is a really good way to prove that you're not decentralized is to start censoring transactions. So. I can't really see them doing this. So e even if you were to say it was centralized, uh, specifically because of the fact that we still get the immutability, we still get the censorship resistance, it really wouldn't matter. But my main point, though, is uh, it it's not centralized. But 
even if we say that it is, um, we still get what we need out of it, and that's what matters. So uh, another aspect is the high performance aspect of it. So of course, EOS is a delegated proof of stake uh, blockchain, and I know for a fact that Dan has been building uh, that blockchain based on what I've read in the white paper as well, um, with parallelization in mind in terms of how transactions are handled. So typically on a lot of blockchains, when you do validation, it's only handled with a single thread. So not to get too technical here, but more or less you're looking at maybe something around like 5,000 to 10,000 transactions, like a second. Uh, if you're only processing on a single thread, and that's that's under optimal conditions. So optimal conditions being like a very small amount of like block producers. But if that could be parallelized, um, you could have multiple threads doing validation, and then we start to get to the goal that EOS has, as well as the other graphene and DPoS-based blockchains that Dan has developed, um, aiming more towards the whole 1 million transactions per second. But uh, we do know already that uh, EOS is not going to be handling that uh, from the get-go. I think Unicron gave me an estimate of around 5,000 off EOS's initial launch, which sounds more or less right with the estimate that I gave earlier. Yeah, it's about 3,000 or something uh, early tests, but it's hard to say right now. Right. So another really uh, in important thing to point out is the inherited security model of this. So what I mean by that is uh, when you roll your own blockchain, you are subjugating yourself to be attacked, obviously. Um, and even if you use another blockchain's uh, source code um, and it has been attacked, then that doesn't necessarily mean your blockchain won't be attacked. So for example, um, I know there have been projects that have forked LISC in the past that have been attacked because they have very poor distribution and then you can cause some havoc in terms of the blockchain. And just for example, because proof of work works fine on Bitcoin, doesn't mean that somebody else isn't going to get 51% on a smaller chain and then start doing some naughty double spending attacks. So just because a consensus mechanism works on one chain does not mean it'll work on the other, especially if the other is a lot smaller in terms of the chain. So using EOS here lets us inherit their security model. If EOS is secure, it means a Novosphere is secure in terms of uh, how it can be attacked at a blockchain level. So this, this is a really good aspect here because it means that we as Novosphere have to do far less uh, code auditing related to the blockchain, and instead we're inheriting EOS's uh, auditing and EOS's security in that aspect, which obviously they have a greater budget in that aspect and a lot more people working on that. So I, I think that's a really big pro, and I want to stress that spe like specifically because of the inherited security model of using an existing blockchain, it speeds up the development time of Novosphere a lot. <laughs> so this is a really important uh, factor here uh, to do with the pros of why EOS could be used. Um, so another question, I guess that uh, one of the obvious questions that get raised is, okay, well, how does public, or sorry, how does self-hosting work if you run on EOS? Um, so we, we can have two configuration modes for how Novosphere nodes work, because there still are going to be Novosphere nodes that you do run on your computer if you want to access content locally. If you don't want to access content locally, then you actually don't need to run anything on your computer because um, everything just sort of works out. You can use the public gateway, which will connect, you know, to a public uh, Novosphere node as well. So uh, the Novosphere node would have two modes of running, which is you could pair it as well against a locally ran EOS node which would basically be the optimal security model. So this would be like kind of imagine you're running Electrum and you're also running Bitcoin Core and you're running an Electrum server pointed at your Bitcoin Core. So you're not relying on other Electrum servers. So you have the highest like privacy that you can get out of Electrum in that sense because your data is not leaking through a third party server. So in this case, uh, that would be like the, the best security setup you could have is run your own Office Free node, run your own EOS node. But obviously cool. running an EOS node is probably going to be uh, very bulky in terms of what you need. 
So the lighter setup to that would be to just run a NovaSphere down and point it to an EOS node. And as I said before, we can assume that the EOS blockchain is very uh, unlikely to be censored. So we don't really lose anything significant in terms of security by doing this. So um, with the NovaSphere node that you are uh, running locally actually does is it builds the database index uh, based on the data in the DAP. And then from that database index, you are able to access the content locally and use the local UI on your own computer without depending on a third party other than the third party EOS node. Um, so not really much changes in terms of self-hosting. You still have uh, censorship resistance. You can still avoid using a public gateway if you want and not all that much changes. Uh, so more or less like briefly summarizing the economic model stays the same. Uh, well, actually, let's go back to the economic model. Um, uh, everything else uh, stays the same except for the whole block producers thing. Instead of block producers, we replace that with the role of running a public gateway, which maybe we don't feel that's uh, as important of a task as a block producer. So we might factor that into inflation uh, a little differently, but uh, more or less everything stays the exact same. Um, there will still be judges to handle uh, how um, bounties are handled. There will still be a staking mechanism where you do have to stake slash vest your Atmos to be have a voting weight. Um, there will still be a paid inflation to people who are staking their Atmos. There will be a paid inflation to people who are voted to run public gateways, and there uh, will be paid inflation to a DAO. And likewise, uh, voting in the DAO to release funds, etc works pretty much the same. So the economic model doesn't change too much. We keep censorship resistance, which is one of the very important factors of how this application needs to work. And we have high performance and inherent security model. But let me get to, I guess I sort of should cover this one first. Now let me get to the actual main point as to why EOS works and Ethereum doesn't. So this is something that goes, I think, overlooked in terms of a lot of the people who support Ethereum because Ethereum has been getting compared to EOS since uh, it's you know pretty much been announced. Um, EOS presents an alternative to the economic model of how a blockchain works. Um, it works off of a similar model to Steam where you have bandwidth allocated to you, bandwidth being the resources in terms of how many transactions you do or how much storage space you take up in terms of the blockchain. So the way this actually differs from Ethereum um, and why it allows us to be able to build on EOS and not on Ethereum is because of the fact when you build an application on EOS or a contract, the developer of the contract can have staked funds or staked EOS, which gives him um, access to resources and storage, and he can actually divert that to the contract. So what that means is the people using the contract uh, have a subsidy, essentially. They have access to more resources than they normally would if they are using the contract. So because of that, it can make using uh, the application a lot more friendly. It doesn't require the user to actually have uh, a large amount of EOS for you know, pretty much any at all, is my understanding. What it does still require, though, and this is something Unicron pointed out, uh, which arguably can be both a pro and a con, is it does require them to still set up an EOS account. Um, but I'm going to assume that's a fairly painless process. Uh, assuming you've used Steam, it's not exactly too difficult to register a Steam account. So uh, having an EOS account would be required, but the point is, is that users don't need to pay for every action that they do on the blockchain, and we can subsidize those actions so that they're able to do more actions than they normally would um, using development funds pointed at the contract. So I think that may, mainly sums up the 
the pros for EOS. Um, maybe you can go over some of the cons that you mentioned on Unicron. Oh yeah, I made like a little table of pros and cons. Um, can, I, can you guys hear me, my volume? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I guess, yeah, I'll quickly go over the table of pros and cons, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, so maybe, one you can, maybe you can share it in the chat if you, if you have it written out or something. Oh no, just for the pen. <laughs> so yeah, no problem. One of the first things is that the, uh, the latency for EOS is quite fast. They have uh, basically half second block times, or it actually it's half, uh, I forget exact number for that, but basically the latency is how fast they can send a transaction and somebody can send a response back. So you can imagine for using an app, it'd be extremely seamless. Uh, even three seconds is already like feeling quite fast because one, uh, 1. 1.5, <laughs> that's a dog that's cool um so uh yes like like uh asphyxia said <laughs> yeah like asphyxia said the security will be handled for them and they have a lot of people working on it and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll they can handle a lot of the polish that's necessary for uh securing the network uh, but at the same time there's a lot of gpos code out there that's uh, very useful for writing a copy of it uh, the standard token could be useful because uh, if, to get added to more exchanges, it helps to for the exchanges not to have to like learn a whole new structure or something or a whole new client. It'd be just part of the EOS client. Um, then EOS also offers uh, this thing called side chains, which doesn't have much uh, literature. I'll, I'll paste the image that I found uh, describing it on the side. So just to go over a quick point that Unicron made that I actually forgot is what he's saying is as a token on EOS, very similar to how we have tokens on Ethereum, um, blockchain, or sorry, not blockchains, uh, exchanges are actually have an easier time adding uh, us to the exchange because it means that it's far less for them to audit because it's not as if they need to run any new software on their computer to be able, or their, uh, their setups to be able to add us to the exchange so they don't have to really do a whole lot of auditing on their part. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I, I'm struggling right now to quite uh, get grasp the sidechain tech that they're proposing because I don't think it's yet polished or done, but uh, that's something to consider in the future. Uh, the no fees, of course, is very nice for uploading, downloading, uh, you know, polishing the sorting mechanism. Um, making it as seamless as possible. Then uh, and, uh, the last thing was that the uh, the full nodes, according to them, can be uh, only scanning the apps or the accounts they care about. And that's kind of something that uh, the creator of it, uh, Dan or whatever, um, he's always been very, very passionate about nodes being able to validate without having to validate every other useless app that people don't care about uh, and doing all kinds of tricks uh, with how they uh, register the transactions on the chain to, to allow to do that. But at the same time, again, EOS is not done yet completely. So that's the, that leads me to the cons panel, which is the design is quickly changing, you know, to different values. It's always in flux and designing it right, coding it right now could be very, could be constantly having to go back and change things pretty significantly. And maybe something could be completely game breaking, who knows? The uh, could have a lot of issues since it's so new and uh right now it's just it's not out yet and when it is out it's uh could be problematic uh it could be early bugs and so on overflow errors who knows um at the same time they do have like two billion in funding so that's that's a positive i guess <clears throat> to polish those errors uh if we wanted to change something on the blockchain to make our job easier, like changing blockchain parameters, maybe slowing it down, speeding it up, changing something else. Uh, we wouldn't have as much control over it because we'd be limited by whatever the platform decides. So we'd be connected to the, to the success or I guess how the platform works uh, versus being able to change it ourselves. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's again, like the, the surface, attack surface of EOS is unknown. Uh, we don't know. Uh, a lot about it and even though i guess dpos has been running since 2014 uh live pretty much and at least two 
plus chains. Uh, it's, each iteration is different and we have to always consider, I guess, I mean, ideally I'd like to build on Bitcoin if possible and you know, if it was fast enough, it was cheap enough, it, just because it has the longest amount of time running and there's a lot of work put into minimizing attack surface so that we don't have to worry about uh, various uh, issues. Yeah, RSK might work, might not. It's hard to tell right now. Um, they have a federated site chain right now, and I'm not sure they'll adapt the, uh, what is it called, the uh, uh, Truth Coins guy, uh, I forgot his name, um, Drive Chain to, uh, to, to, to attach to RSK. So I'm not entirely sure how, how successful it's gonna be yet. And same thing with EOS, it's not out yet as well completely, and uh, a lot of the specs are not out. Yeah, and the problem, the fee model, of course. I, I guess I was saying is that maybe there's could be like a different side chain to something else like EOS, but it's too early to say right now, regardless. So I was going to propose that we keep going with the, uh, you know, the current development, but also, you know, work, uh, work at least partially, at least somebody works on the DAP development. And if it looks like uh, it's far enough, while well, we already tested a lot of the logic that goes into contracts, bounties, and so on. Uh, maybe we, uh, you know, transfer it to the EOS later after a vote. But uh, I think it's a little early to work to, you know, to uh, completely devote ourselves to work on a very hypothetical, not I don't know, hypothetical, but uh, very rapidly uncertain, <laughs> rapidly changing uncertain network. Uh, that's all I have to say. So I, I think what I want, I want uh, a few things that I wanted to add. Part of my suggestion and proposal was not exactly to drop everything and say, okay, let's go build one in the US, because obviously there's going to be uh, time for the community to either decide that we believe as a community that we should be building on the US, or we believe that we should continue with the status quo. Um, the two things to point out here is uh, status quo obviously does have a longer development timeline in terms of uh, how long it takes to actually produce the final product uh, versus EOS. But um, what I think the best move for us to do is in the process of allowing the plain vote to happen, um, I can make a pivot from what I'm working on right now, which is right now I've been working on mainly the blockchain layer of the project in terms of Novosphere. Uh, I can make a pivot to working on the um, the application layer. So the application layer is the Novosphere node that people would be running on their computers. So if you want to think about it in in the first case scenario. Hold on. Hold on. So the, it's only the one that In the first case scenario, um uh, yeah I muted him. Uh, you can message me taps if you want me to unmute you if you've already muted yourself. Um in the first case scenario, you can think about it as a person would be running both the Novosphere node, so the node being like, uh, well, I guess it can be two in one in this case. So, but we can separate it, right? So we can separate application layer from blockchain. And in the EOS case, we, we separate it. Um, even in this case, we can separate it and it really wouldn't make much of a difference. So the application layer is really what gives people access to the content that's in the blockchain and uh, how that's handled. So the, the nice thing about uh, an application layer is so once that's built, uh, it could be plugged into um, any, any type of blockchain. So for example, uh, as a hypothetical, once the application layer is designed, if for whatever reason, let's say we wanted to do a, or a blockchain layer that interface with something like Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash uh, or Ethereum, uh, we could do that, or, you know, we could do a blockchain layer that interfaces with EOS, or we could do a blockchain layer that's actually just our own thing, which is currently what status quo is right now. So I think the focus needs to pivot uh, here, at least at this time, while the, the vote happens to allow for uh, me to work on the application layer and, instead of the blockchain layer, so we can sort of decide do we want to continue pursuing developing the blockchain layer uh, versus, let's say, building on EOS? And I guess the major things that we've considered is what do we really get out of 
building um, our own blockchain layer instead of just building on EOS. And as Unicron pointed out, the main thing that we do get is um, we get tighter control over a lot of the finer details of the underlying blockchain. But the trade-off to that is we don't get necessarily the same uh, security model as some of the bigger blockchains do. And we can't exactly piggyback off of it in the same way. The security model not only being how the blockchain it can be attacked, but the security model also being how well that blockchain has been audited and who it's been audited by and the resources that have been put into auditing that contract, or sorry, auditing that blockchain to try to attack it. So. These are all things that need to be taken into consideration here. So I think I should expand a little more on what I mean by the, the application layer. Um, so let's say I, I work on this application layer and I have it done, let's say a month or two, um, assuming that's how long we run the vote for. Um, I believe EOS is planning on launching in like June. Um, well, okay, yeah, hang on. I'll reply to what you said, like Unicron. Um, so I think a two month timeline to allow for the vote might be a little rushed, maybe two or three months. I, I don't really know, but I don't think the application layer will take uh two months, or, or sorry, I don't think it'll take three months. So, uh, that's definitely something that we need to consider. Uh, but the application layer is at least something I would be able to give to developers. Uh, like let's say code blue and he would be able to run the application layer on his computer start building his application for it and pretty much when the blockchain layer is plugged into it nothing would need to change in terms of his code everything would work so that that does actually allow other developers that are interested in our project to continue to work on it and continue building on it I still think that we should uh, do a vote, but I can't see really many people, at least in my opinion, being too against the idea of building on EOS, uh, mainly for, like I said, the security model aspect, but also from the fact that we benefit a lot from joining a bigger community in this aspect, right? Because it introduces a lot of, it sort of piggybacks our community onto theirs. Uh, yes, the vote would be weighted off of uh, the number of coins you have. Um, and so, but, but like by, yeah, so that's, that's a big plus, right? So by building it as an application on EOS, you expose yourself to a bigger audience, especially like right off the bat in terms of people that will be willing to come and try your application uh, as opposed to being a completely separate project. Um, people are very hostile when it comes to blockchain projects. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you're your own separate project, everyone you know, feels you're a competitor. Well, okay, maybe like the developers of the other blockchain don't feel you're a competitor, but like the communities are very tribalistic. Um, whereas like none of the Ethereum, um, you know, projects, like let's say, you know, BAT, uh, you know, nobody's, nobody's saying, you know, Brave is going to replace Ethereum, right? So when you build on another platform, you sort of, you know, interrupt into their community. Um, now, in regards to what Unicron said, uh, yeah, that is a third option that we have uh, considered, which is uh, the, let's say we, you know, uh, you know, like their code base when we decided, okay, let's, let's just take their code base and we can, you know, continue taking their updates and we can just sort of replace, uh, let's say EOS with Atmos in this case, if we were to do that, I'm just saying it as a hypothetical. The problem is, is uh, keeping up to date with backporting everything as well as any changes that we've made. And so what I mean by that is if you look at, for example, um, in the Bitcoin world, Bitcoin Unlimited, which was a fork from Bitcoin Core, maybe I think 12 or 11, Holy, they've fallen so far behind, like in terms of, uh, maybe it's like you need them like further. They've fallen very far behind in terms of uh, keeping up to date with what's in core and all the security patches that have came out in core. You know, like Bitcoin Unlimited doesn't even have like SegWit right now. So it's like you almost have like zero incentive to use it. <laughs> 
So I don't really know if uh, forking a code base and trying to keep up to date with it is a great idea. Maybe if like there was someone who's like their entire job was just to backport the updates, like it might be viable. But um, yeah, it's I don't think it's the most optimal idea. It's possible, but I don't think it's the most optimal. Did I miss something? Oh, okay, here we go. So, I think that pretty much covers a lot of what we have to say about EOS. Um, I know Code Blue wanted to give an update on his uh, project that he's been working on, but uh, if anyone has like, any questions pertaining to the whole potentially building on EOS thing, uh, now's a good time to ask. Uh, especially if you have any concerns. Uh, so, guys, I was just wondering, um, you know, in terms of how the testnet development has been going, what does that change if you're going to pivot towards the application layer? Does that mean that we don't work on the testnet stuff for the time being? Or, you know, in terms of you know, just the sort of roadmap that's been kind of laid out over the last few weeks? Yeah, so this would be a definitely a drastic change in terms of the roadmap because it, it's a change in priorities, right? So the testnet is basically the blockchain, um, the blockchain layer of the project. And you, like I said, you can split it into two, two uh, components, which is the application layer and the blockchain layer. So um, yeah, we in this case, we would temporarily halt work or working on the, on the Novosphere testnet. And instead we would, so basically we'd halt working on the blockchain layer and we'd just start working on the application layer. And this isn't really a loss in terms of uh, productivity towards the project because we're still working on something that would need to get done inevitably, but it is a shift in terms of priorities because prior to this or prior to needing to call this type of a coin vote, um, the priority would have been building on the blockchain layer, whereas now the priority becomes building the application layer because there's uncertainty about what the blockchain layer actually is. So does that does that help clarify uh, your question? Yeah, no, that that does. Um, I mean, that's what I assumed, but I was just making sure that um, yeah, I was understanding it correctly. Yeah, so again, just to like emphasize on this, once the application layer is designed, it is possible, like I said, to build different blockchain layers and redeploy Novosphere on different blockchains. Um, so you could like you, you could have one that let's say runs on Ethereum or Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. It's just you would have the fees along for the ride and you wouldn't be able to do anything about that because that's just how the underlying blockchain works. So I don't really know why anyone would do that, but I'm just saying like that is a possibility. So the blockchain layer is very interoperable with this design. Like it can be swapped out to whatever. Yeah, I mean I'm a huge fan of EOS. So I'm I mean, to me, it's it was definitely always a question of why not look at look at it as an option. Um I just wasn't sure uh, you know, what the the needs of the the Novosphere blockchain would would have, so whether or not any other blockchain would you know function. So I'm you know, I'm definitely interested in having this explored. Yeah. So my suggestion was just to clarify it again. Was uh, pri the, the new priority becomes the application layer, which is still a, a, a part of our project. It needs to get done no matter what, and this gives time for a coin vote to occur to sort of see and gauge the community's opinion on whether this is a, a good idea or not. Uh, regarding what you said, the, the demands for Novosphere are, I'll, I'll post a short summary that I actually posted in the, in the whale chat as to what I think uh, it boils down to. But I, I think the main aspect that ruled out a lot of the other blockchains was really that fee model, because I'm I'm, I don't think there's really any other blockchains that allow you to subsidize the fees in such a way where you're not spending money to do transactions and you are also allowed to subsidize fees for users of your application you know like even on ethereum when they deploy a dap like let's say a decentralized exchange on ethereum you still have to pay fees for every transaction that you do when you place an order that's a fee when you cancel an order that's a fee and that was a problem in bit shares i remember like people did not like this right people hated having to pay fees to cancel orders so, uh, 
So I might not be able to answer like all your questions regarding EOS. I actually think Unicron probably knows more about EOS uh, in terms of general information than I do. But um, yeah, I can definitely help uh, answer concerns in regards to uh, what projects are or what blockchains are viable and why or why not uh, they are viable. So. Um, in terms of the economic model and 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 voting and all that aspect, um, so since we wouldn't be voting for block producers any longer, what would be the the sort of state? Like, how would the staking mechanism actually work? It would just be essentially putting your coins into a a hold. Yeah, okay, so technically you are still in a sense staking, right? Your con your coins would become unspendable. How they become vested in the the contract would handle this right it's no different than if a blockchain makes your coins unspendable versus if let's say the contract that's holding your coins makes them unspendable um so in, in this case you still vest your coins to basically have a stake and then you can use that stake to vote for various things so for example you vote for who you know people being um running the public gateways you'd vote for uh you know judges to handle the uh bounty system uh you and you could also vote for content so that's like upvoting downvoting uh, and that sort of thing so there's still a staking system mechanism in place for there's a governance system in place essentially uh, that relies on the utmost token. So th this isn't something I guess I didn't put an emphasis on when I sort of talked about this at this meeting, but I did put an emphasis on it when I talked about it in the, the whale chat is um, even with this design of building on EOS, Atmos does not suffer from the design that I critique a lot in Ethereum, which is you have a token that's along for the ride. A lot of projects in Ethereum have this problem where you have to ask yourself why does the token exist right what does this token actually do for me or and a lot of projects don't really have a good answer to that it's sort of along for the ride and it really only exists because that project did a crowdfund so and they needed to give something back to the participants of that crowdfund so in this case atmos still needs to exist like no matter what it's still a fundamental part of our governance it's still part of electing the uh, public gateways, the judges, the upvoting and downvoting, uh, handling content, and that sort of thing. And of course, um, there would still be the same inflation schedule. So the economic model, as I said, doesn't really change that much. The only thing that changes instead of electing block producers, you elect people to run public gateways. And the nice part about that is you're going to end up possibly with pu multiple public gateways in different jurisdictions, to different legal jurisdictions. So yeah, if anyone has any other questions, I mean, feel free to shoot. Don't be shy. Okay, well, I guess if anyone has any questions, they can follow up in the chat and I can reply to them there. And uh, I can turn it over to Code Blue who can give us an update on what he's been doing. Uh, someone's watching TV in the background, so I, I don't know if you guys can hear that. Uh, if it's too bad, then I can just type, whatever. Uh, but... Basically, um, I started adding... I started adding some more filtering functions on the search, um, by the, the letter, I guess, the first letter. There's the pagination for, um, when there's um a lot more like content so i don't know how many like shows you want to show on the list but anyway that's just for scaling purposes um and then if you go into the uh into the content page there's the episode list uh and then i added a submit new episode button, I guess. It's just I'm working on being able to uh, submit the uh, the metadata for the episodes. And then on the newly added tab, there's also a list of uh, shows um, with the fields being filterable. 
I guess it's just the like numeric alpha numerical filter. And then there's also uh, submitting a new series or adding uh, a new series. Um, a lot of the data, like a lot of the fields for these forms um, are not complete. I just started adding it. Um, and then I guess that's about it. I can't think of much else, but yeah. Yeah, it looks good so far. It's definitely coming along. Um, so once I can actually, uh, once the application layer is actually finished, uh, and you actually have the application layer and you're able to run it on your own, uh, you would actually be able to plug in all of the API that you would need to add content and uh, sort of manage the, the content that your web interface would be interacting with. So mm -hmm. once the uh, application layer is actually done for the project, you sort of have a final um, a final API to work with, and you would be able to build your project uh, without worrying about uh, what happens in terms of the underlying um, blockchain decision. Um, so right, I think yeah. that's actually really good for uh, developers that are trying to right now, such as yourself, to build stuff on the platform. Yeah, I mean, if the application layer is not done, then I can't really <laughs> implement any of the uh, calls and stuff. So. Yeah, right, right now I can see from what you have, obviously all of this stuff is temporary. Uh, none of mm -hmm. this stuff is really in the database or anything like that. Yeah. So. so yeah, it's coming along. Pretty cool. Thanks for keeping us up to date. No problem. So yeah, if anyone has anything they want to talk about at this meeting, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you know, floor is yours. If anyone wants to ask any other questions relating to our current proposal of potentially building on EOS, uh, good time to ask. Or if anyone wants to ask Code Blue about anything in regarding to what he's doing. Too bad Lutz is not in the chat. I know he'd ask you if you were willing to build a porn interface for him. Um, but yeah. <laughs> That's not exactly difficult. <laughs> it's just some metadata. So, um, what's the process of like a becoming a like a DAP on EOS? Like, have they worked that out yet? Uh, yeah. So you can already deploy DAPs on uh, EOS on their well, not on their mainnet. Obviously, you can run testnet. Uh, there's not a public testnet, but you can run your own uh, testnet. Actually, you know what, I want to bring this up because uh, this is maybe something a lot of people overlooked. A lot of people laughed when Amazon came out with the whole Ethereum template thing, you know, run your own private Ethereum blockchain on Amazon. You know, why would I ever want to do that? Um, the reason you would want to do that is it's mainly for sandbox testing. You would never actually do it to, like, run a real blockchain, but it's it's it gives you access to a little better testing environment than if you were running on a public testnet, because you don't actually have to wait for blocks to be mined, which can be a pain uh, in terms of the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And I assume like other blockchains might suffer from a similar problem in terms of like lag as to how fast blocks are being mined. But um, yeah, so anyways, going back to the EOS thing, um, they use WebAssembly to deploy their contracts. So WebAssembly is something really new that's been uh, growing in terms of how internet browsers uh, can handle things. Um, so it's pretty interesting how they've handled that. I'm personally actually not as much of a fan as to how EOS contracts are written at this time as I am to how Ethereum contracts are written. I think Ethereum has a much more elegant approach to this. That's not to say that EOS's approach to it is particularly bad. It more so has to just do with programming preference, if anything. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. Maybe you can repeat it. I think I've gone off topic a bit. Uh, no, that, that that does. I mean, I, I guess what I was wondering is if, if we get the application layer and we're not ready to like, hey, like let's deploy this, you know, we could, I, I mean, I guess, is it possible to test stuff using, you know, whatever's, whatever's available on the EOS testnet? Uh, yeah, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually link you to an, ex an example of one of uh, an EOS uh, contract, and you can take a look at it. It's one of the ones that I took a look at. Um, so 
here's one of them. It's a very simple dice game that's built on EOS as a contract. So you can already write contracts on EOS and test them on your own. So yeah, if, ah. if we finish the application layer and the community did decide, okay, let's go with EOS, the next thing that we would begin doing is uh, working on developing uh, the smart contract code to deploy on EOS. I, I see. Well, that that's cool. So we're we're, I mean, while you're doing what you're you know doing in terms of the pivot towards the application layer, will you be looking at what you know that deployment looks like to make sure that there's nothing that you're not aware of? Or I mean, is that is that something you have to research, or is it something that's really obvious? So at this time, it seems like everything you you basically so right now EOS is their their smart contracts are being written in um, C++. So it seems more or less we have access to all the uh, heavy lifting that we'd be able to, that we need to like make the underlying uh, system of Novus via the DAP. So uh, at this time, I'm fairly confident that everything can be built into the contract. But as Unicron said, things are changing and there are other languages that are being looked at uh, in terms of uh, being able to compile to WebAssembly. Because the way EOS contracts works is uh, you write it in C++ and then you compile it to the WebAssembly format and then you push the EOS, the WebAssembly file. So if, for example, you create a compiler for, let's say, Python, as he uh, said, that compiles down to WebAssembly, then you can use Python also to write contracts on EOS. So at this time, from what I understand, EOS's contract system, though, as C++ does have all the requirements that we would need to build the system. Um, oh, I guess Lutz isn't in the chat, so I will reply to him in the chat. I was going to give an update about the white paper. Uh, I guess we're in draft version two now. Uh, I sent it to Asphyxia uh, yesterday or two days ago. Uh, so that's coming along well, I think. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, so we can actually uh, look to release. Uh, well, I, I was looking to release uh, that to the community pretty soon, but given this uh, pivot thing, just one moment, let me just actually reply to this. Um, yeah, so given this, this whole pivot thing, I think it might be worth it to take the time to uh, add in uh, or refactor, you know, sort of some parts of what we've written to consider the whole EOS aspect of it and sort of detail how things would work if they are built on EOS as opposed to, yeah, you know, running our own uh, blockchain layer. So we can look to share that with the community. Uh, this week, but what that does mean, again, just to follow up on what we said last week, it means that we're not launching the thread today, uh, and we're not launching a final white paper uh, right away, because we're going to basically have ambiguity of, are we building on EOS or are we not? And depending on that, that's sort of what will dictate the final white paper, but we can share the draft with the community uh, so they can sort of see where things are currently at. So yeah, if anyone has any other questions or any topics they want to talk about, then that would be a great time. It doesn't necessarily need to be related to Novosphere. It could be another cool crypto project that you're interested in. Okay, well, I guess that's it then for this meeting. Thanks for attending, guys, and I guess I'll see you again next week. And we're going to look to start the, the coin vote uh, probably, I want to say, on Wednesday. Um, I can't give a def def uh, definite timeline of how long it's going to last. I would estimate it to be at least at, m at minimum one month, but very likely more closer to like two, two and a half. Um, I'm going to write a blog post 
uh, detailing everything that was talked about in this meeting. So you'll have it all in textual format. Uh, it'll sort of give the summary of the points that I made uh, in terms of the pros for EOS, as well as the pros and cons that Unicron uh, talked about in terms of EOS. So the community has an idea of um, what the pros and cons are of these approaches. So, yeah, thanks guys for attending, and I look forward to that blog post. I'll probably have it out on Monday or Tuesday. Blog post will come out before the coin book starts. All right, thanks again. Take right. care, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.